Bienvenue, bienvenue à l'Institut français de, de Jérusalem. Good evening. Bienvenue surtout à nos illustres hôtes, le professeur Ilan Papé et Jonathan, Jonathan Cook. I'm very honored and pleased to host you, uh, Professor and Jonathan, all the more than uh, it's my last event as a director of this uh, institution. So for a conclusion, it's a very high level conclusion. I'm very privileged and honored uh, to uh, host you uh, tonight uh, in, uh, in cooperation with the educational educational bookshop uh, which I want to to uh, to command the, the work here uh, for uh, the service of culture in East Jerusalem just before giving the floor to uh, uh, Mahmoud and uh, for educational bookshop just to to let you know that uh, your struggle or joint struggle for culture in East Jerusalem uh, is really the uppermost important mission of this uh, French Institute here so I will I want really to commend you, your work uh, and the work of all our partners here around the Saladin Street and you can really count on the mobilization and the continuing work of the French Institute uh, uh, in Jerusalem. So thank you uh, for the attendance to be so many people, uh, many people uh, tonight and now I let the floor to Mahmoud uh, who will introduce all our guests tonight. Thank you. Almost. Thank you very much. Augusta, it was an honor. It was an honor uh, to work with you, and uh, we're looking forward for a long relationship with the French Institute, our neighbors, and we wish you luck in your next post around the world, and we're looking forward to see you in Jerusalem in the future. Now, without any further ado, it's really so nice to see so many faces of you here, and I'm very sorry for people standing. We've been working since one o'clock this afternoon, trying to put as many seats as possible in this beautiful garden. We are short of few, so I apologize on behalf of the team. We, uh, ha I'm honored tonight to have uh, Yara Hawari here on my right. She is a PhD candidate of uh, Ilan Pape at Exeter University. And you might have came across her writings. She writes in the Independent, Electronic Intifada, and the Journal of Palestinian Studies. She's a Palestinian face, a young face, and a young, important voice for us here in Jerusalem. And I'm honored that she accepted our invitation to chair the event this afternoon. So I'll hand you to her. Please turn off your mobile phone. If you're standing, make sure you're not obstructing anyone behind you. Be ready, because we have enough people to start a revolution this afternoon. <laughs> and I have the green line from the French to do so. That's all right. <laughs> In, <laughs> enjoy. I'm looking forward for an informative discussion. We're aiming for a short introduction and then allowing as many as uh, possible uh, questions from the floor. The books, all of Ilan Pape's books and Jonathan Cook's uh, books are also on sale. Thank you very much for coming. Yara, the floor is yours. Okay, um, so thank you all very much for coming uh, to this book launch of Israel and South Africa, The Many Faces of Apartheid. Um, when the bookshop asked me to do this introduction, I was a bit apprehensive. Ilan Pape, who's the editor of this book, is, as Mahmoud said, um, he's... Uh, the supervisor of my PhD, and I owe him a lot of work. So <laughs> I hope he's not going to bring me up on that later. <laughs> anyway, as I said, uh, Ilan Pape is actually the editor um, of the book, and he's currently the professor, um, professor at University of Exeter. He's also the director of the European Center for Palestine Studies. Ilan is regarded as one of the Israeli New Historians, a group of Israeli academics who sought to challenge the Zionist narrative in the late 80s and 90s. Um, particularly surrounding the events of 1948. In 2006, he published his seminal work, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. And since then, he's written many books on Israel and Palestine, all of which, of course, are available at the bookshop. In much of his work, Ilan has written extensively about settler colonialism, a framework which he and many other scholars believe more accurately represents the situation on the ground here. What often follows settler colonialism is a system of apartheid which keeps the native, the inferior other, separate from that of the superior settler race. These concepts form the theoretical framework for the book. And tonight we're also lucky to be joined by Jonathan Cook, uh, one of the contributors of the book. Jonathan is an award-winning British journalist and a writer based in Nazareth. He's written three books on Israel and Palestine, which are also available um, at the bookshop, and many more chapters and articles. In the book we're presenting tonight, 
Jonathan's chapter is entitled Visible Equality as a Confidence Trick, and he focuses on the Palestinian citizens of Israel. In this chapter, Jonathan manages to encapsulate the situation of these often forgotten Palestinians and concludes that separateness, or apartheid, and inequality based on ethnic belonging has been codified in Israeli law and as such has been shielded from international condemnation. As you may have guessed by now, the book itself does not ask whether apartheid exists in Israel and Palestine. Rather, it affir affirms seriously and intelligently that it does indeed exist and offers a series of arguments using a comparative approach on Israel and South Africa. The chapters in the book show us not only how Israel and South Africa apartheid South Africa are similar, but also, importantly, how they are different. As a result, what we see is an excellent book um, and a brave publication that allows us to take the discussion to the next level. So I'd like to end this uh, introduction with just a quote uh, from Virginia Tilley's chapter, uh, Redefining Conflict in Israel and Palestine, which I think might be interesting to many of you who work within an international law framework. Israel's occupation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip has digressed so far from the terms of reference of international humanitarian law that Israel's behavior cannot be adequately described in terms of discrete violations. Israel now controls the OPT in all ways consistent with sovereignty, except the political will of the territory's population. Steadily settling the West Bank, Israel's behavior is fully consistent with settler colonialism. With half a million settlers in the West Bank, the situation could have been recognized as having passed the tipping point long ago, were it not the international community still wedded doggedly to the paradigm of belligerent occupation and evolving formulations of Palestinian people that have, under enormous pressure, adjusted to suit the Zionist project. The precedent of apartheid South Africa helps to clarify that Israel's willingness to consign portions of the West Bank to a Palestinian state is more accurately is most accurately comparable to a Bantustan strategy to concentrate black people within politically suffocating, disarticulated, and economically crippling enclaves. One irony emerges most clearly from the South African comparison, that the UN has actually obstructed resolution of the conflict by insisting on Israel's withdrawal from the OPT. It is incontestable that legally, Israel holds the territories under belligerent occupation and has illegally transferred Jewish settlers um, into East Jerusalem and the West Bank. Yet in insisting that Israel not be allowed to annex these territories, the UN has unintentionally forestalled the normal solution to the conflict in advanced cases of settler colonialism, granting full citizenship and equal rights to the indigenous people. Such is the situation in Israel and Palestine, where the colonial state has rendered obsolete one course of justice for the Palestinian people, statehood, while the international community, acting dutifully, to preserve international order and norms has helped to forestall the only logical alternative, unification. Um, so I won't talk anymore. Uh, the book is available over there, and I really recommend uh, that you read it, buy it, um, share it, if you don't want to each buy a copy. But really, it's, it's really a great publication. Uh, I'd like to pass over uh, to Professor Ilan Pape, and then we'll move on to Jonathan Cook. Thank you. I want to begin by thanking the... Uh educational bookshop and the institute for, for hosting us. Uh, it's great to see so many people coming uh, tonight to share with us our understandings and our constant attempt to understand the reality and even more importantly how to change this reality. In many ways the book is yet another stage in this search for a better understanding of the way forward. For about 40 or 50 years, in many places like this, institutes, universities, academic centers, the media, and so on, there was one dominant way or paradigm through which the conflict in Palestine had been analyzed. And this was the paradigm or model of a conflict between two national movements. There is one country for which two national movements are fighting for. They have equal right to the land. They have an equal attachment to the land. And hence, what you need is to find a reasonable 
a mediator who could find a compromise that would answer the aspirations of both national movements, given the fact that they both have a justified claim to the land. This is still the main paradigm for peace that the quartet is using, that the uh, mainstream media and academia and politicians are using, and it's not surprising that the main outcome of this paradigm is the two-state solution as the only possible way forward, because if both national movements have equal right to the land, partitioning the land between the two national movements seems to make sense from a, a kind of political point of view, strategic point of view, and so on. Of course, once you go to higher resolutions, so to speak, and you see that one side is offered 80% of that land, and the other side, at best, is offered 20% of that land, you begin to be a bit doubtful about uh, the ideas of a two-state solution. But let's leave it alone for a moment. Uh, the basic concept of a conflict between national movements had not been challenged properly apart from uh, uh, marginal groups, either in academia or in the media or in politics. Now, in the last 10 or 15 years, from within the civil society around the world, the civil society in Palestine, from within the academia and on the margins of the political systems around the world, came a different paradigm. A paradigm that said, no, we're sorry, the conflict here is not between two national movements. The conflict here was and is between a movement of settlers and the native people. That doesn't mean yet that we know how to solve it, but at least we are speaking a language that relates to the reality on the ground. And the fact that this is a situation where you have settlers who came in the late 19th century, who are now in the third generation, definitely, settlers who succeeded in creating their own society, their own state, their own culture, who are still colonizing the native people, are still settling on the land of the native people, is a, a much better framework to explain to people what goes on here, why there is still violence, why all the peace effort until today has failed, and why we have wasted years and years on using a false paradigm that produced a lot of Nobel Peace Prizes and mountains of documents and hundreds of academic careers and even political careers, but nothing on the ground itself. And this is where we need to go to that paradigm set of colonialism and its connection to the idea of apartheid. Because it was not only the people who supported the perception of the conflict as a conflict between two national movements that got it wrong, for good reasons and bad reasons. I mean, not everybody should be criticized for having this optimistic view that all you need is a, is a grown-up that would come and help these uh, children to find a solution. Surprisingly, they thought that the grown-up is the United States of America, which is a bit ridiculous, especially if we can see the new personification of a grown-up American candidate for presidency, someone who hasn't uh, crossed the age of five. Um, nonetheless, uh, one can understand why people felt optimistic and uh, reasonably satisfied with this approach. But it's not the only problem. This was not the only obstacle for trying to expose the reality in history and at present as a reality of settler colonialism. Also, the Palestinian National Movement, for understandable reasons, I don't know if you are aware of it, refused to see Zionism as settler colonialism. There's a difference between settler colonialism and colonialism. When we talk about colonialism, we talk about people who are sent by an empire to colonize some place outside of Europe. 
And when the empire falls, disintegrates, that people are going back to their metropole homeland, as happened to the British in India, the Algerians in uh, the French in Algeria, and so on. Settler colonialists are people who were not sent by an empire. They ran away, they ran away, they fled for various reasons, a different reason. These are people who fled from Europe for exist and looked for a safe haven. They looked for a safe home. The problem is that the, most of them also looked for a homeland, not just a home. And when they wanted the homeland, they found out that usually the places that they arrived or coveted or wanted for all kinds of reasons, these places were already inhabited by another people. Uh, the famous, and unfortunately uh, we just lost him this year, scholar of settler colonialism, Patrick Wolfs, says that at this moment in history where the people who fled meet the native people, emerges something that he calls the logic of elimination. The logic of elimination means that if I want to turn a new place to my homeland, I have to get rid of the native people. In the United States of America, this ended in genocide. It ended in a similar way in Latin America, in Australia, in New Zealand. In two places, settler, uh, 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 the logic of elimination took a different form, in Palestine and in South Africa. In both places, eliminating the native was not done through genocide, but through either uh, other crimes against humanity, such as ethnic cleansing, dispossession, apartheid, all kinds of means that meant to rob the native from his or her homeland and reattach the settler to that homeland by appropriating the native's uh, history, the native's attachment to the land. It's not surprising that this is also true about other settler colonialist projects, not just South Africa and Israel. When you appropriate the history of the people you destroyed, you quite conveniently even appropriate their own names of places, their own habits, their own customs. In America, it's really bizarre. I mean, they're using the names of Native American tribes that have been uh, uh, exterminated for, for naming their weapons of mass destruction. Tomahawk, Apache, and so on. The Israelis have not gone there yet. Uh, uh, God knows what, what will come from their uh, uh, invention. But this appropriation of the history of the place itself means that you also assume that the place that, was, that belonged to the native is yours. It's history, it's climate, it's heritage. Settler colonialism in Palestine started in the late 19th century. And its first serious implementation of the logic of elimination, and as I said, the logic of elimination in other places was genocide. The logic of elimination in Palestine was implemented in the ethnic cleansing of Palestine in 1948. This was not a coincidence of war. This was not the result of a war. This was the conclusion of a systematic planning by the settler colonialist movement of Zionism that wanted to get rid of the native Palestinian population. The reason that they did not succeed of expelling all the Palestinians, the reason that they did not succeed in occupying the whole of Palestine had to do with circumstances, cap capacities, possibilities, and Palestinian resistance. It had nothing to do with any self-imposed limitation of the vision that can be simply defined as wishing to have as much of Palestine as possible with as few Palestinians as possible. It is an interesting historical coincidence that in the year that the settler colonialist movement in Palestine decided to try and get rid of the Palestinians is the year when the settler movement or settler community of the whites in South Africa decided to institutionalize the apartheid system. It happened at the same year that the both settler colonialist movement wanted to institutionalize through a state apparatus 
the logic of elimination that elsewhere was implemented through genocide. In these two case studies, they found alternative means, and they still, they were using these alternative means in South Africa until the fall of apartheid there. They're still using these means today all over Palestine, not just in the West Bank, not just in the Gaza Strip, also in the Galilee, and also in the Nakab, and Jonathan will talk about it more uh, in his talk. So I began by saying that also the Palestinian national movement did not look at Zionism as settler colonialism, but as a colonialist movement, which did not help us to understand the reality properly. I will exemplify it very shortly by comparing the FLN, the Algerian National Movement, and the ANC, the African National Congress. For many years, the Palestinian national movement believed that it was modeled, or it modeled actually, or emulated the FLN as its major kind of national liberation organization. The biggest achievement of the FLN was kicking out one million French settlers back to France. That's how Algeria became fully independent. Not surprisingly, for very long, the Palestinian National Movement thought that this was the model. You have here colonizers who have to go back to their mother country. But settler colonialists don't have mother countries. Definitely don't have one mother country. They come from 100 mother countries in this particular case. So they, where do you kick them out to, right? The ANC was a different model. The ANC said, our decolonization of South Africa is not through sending back the Dutch, the British, the German, the Belgium, the Danish who came and settled uh, on our land, expropriated our land, expelled us, oppressed us. Our solution is not sending them back to their countries of origin. Our solution is to tell them, yes, you are organically now part of our homeland but not on the basis of the political system that is called apartheid. And this is where Zionism and apartheid have something very much is, is, uh, uh, similar. You cannot, you cannot have dreamt of changing the reality in South Africa. You cannot have even began, begun a genuine process of reconciliation in South Africa without getting rid of apartheid. You could not and the ANC refused to say, let's negotiate, and then we'll end apartheid. No, the ANC said apartheid will end, and then we can start to talk about reconciliation, peace, justice, and democracy. Therefore, any peace paradigm that re retains Israel as a Zionist state has no chance in the world of succeeding. In a similar way, to the way that we had to get rid of apartheid. We have to get rid of Zionism before we talk about reconciliation. No other solution will work in this place because Zionism is a settler colonial movement, which is not a curse. I'm not cursing Zionism when I say it's settler colonialist movement. America was built as a settler colonialist movement. Australia was built as a settler colonialist movement. Saying that the movement is a settler colonialist movement does not mean that I compare them to the Nazis or that I demonize them beyond any uh, 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 repair. No, settler colonialism is a historical fact. People from Europe settled under the bayonet, with the help of the British bayonets in someone else's land, took by force their land, expelled them, and continue to take by force their land, expel them, and not allow them equal rights as full citizens. It's actually a very simple story that Israel always tried to tell us is very complicated and only they can understand how complicated it is, so you better follow their interpretation and ideas of solution. No, it's a simple story. Settler colonialism has affected the world in so many places that you don't need to invent the wheel to understand what goes on here in Palestine. It's not that unique, unfortunately, for white settlers to come colonize a place and call it their own homeland. It's also not quite unique, by the way, to create an apartheid system when genocide was not an option for whatever reason. 
Apartheid is the second best option, like ethnic cleansing, in order to implement the logic of elimination. I want to eliminate the native, but I cannot eliminate it, him or her physically. So I am enclaving him. I imprison the native in his own village. I don't allow him to expand in his cities. I put a siege on Gaza. I try to induce or convince the native to immigrate. There are so many things I can do as a powerful state that do not have to be translated into genocidal policies in order to feel that I completely fulfilled my idea of a successful settler colonial state. And hence, coming back to the Palestinian national movement, the moment, and I think we are at this moment, that more and more Palestinian activists, politicians, intellectuals, are beginning to accept the analysis of Zionism as settler colonialist movement, they also begin to accept the idea that the Jews who live here now for a third generation are part of the reality. We still need a very clear Palestinian message to the Jewish people who live here. How do you see us in the future? For too many years, the main thing the Palestinian National Movement did was to respond to Israelis' ideas of how Palestinians should live here. It's time to change the role. We need a clear Palestinian message to the people who are here. You are Jews who live in Palestine. This is how we see you in the future. We have never heard such a message. Not from a PLO leader, not from a PLO think tank, not from a Palestinian academic. It's time, now is the time to tell us and to make sure that you take back the initiative because this is the native movement that will tell the settlers under what condition they can enjoy normal life after abusing the normal life of the native for more than a century. Let me just say a few things on the, on, on the book, a few sentences, and then the, I'll, I'll move it. I don't want to anger him because this is very shaky. And if he's angry, I will fall because we are like on a, on a boat here. Uh, so uh, I don't want to get seasick. Um, in uh, all over the, as some of you probably know, that one of the main focus of activity for Palestine in universities in the world is the Israel Apartheid Week. The Israel Apartheid Week is the main focus on one week of activity in solidarity with Palestine, uh, uh, initiated and conducted and, and organized by students. This brought the idea of the book in many ways, because... It's very clear so, that for these students, the model of the struggle of solidarity with the ANC and against apartheid is the model that they're using for solidarity with, with Palestine. But we also felt, after looking at the activity, that apart from the very natural resemblance for the, in the struggle for, against apartheid in South Africa and against Zionism, and the Israeli policies here in Palestine, apart from that, there is a need for a much more profound analysis of this comparison. So we took the idea of the activists, and we said, let us go more deeply into the comparison. Because obviously, there must be also some dissimilarities, not only similarities. And now that so many of us are convinced that we have to struggle against Israel and its policies that in the same way that the ANC struggled to end apartheid in South Africa, we should learn more properly as academics the differences and the commonalities between the two case studies. So we looked at every aspect we could, and we asked South African, Palestinian, Israelis, and the British journalists from Nazareth to join us in this uh, project to try and uh, look at different aspects. And I think what is so interesting uh, in the book that we have an insight into the history of apartheid in South Africa and the emergence of Zionism in Palestine that shows that actually historically the similarities are very, very uh, clear. And it's only when you move into the second half of the 20th century, especially after 1967, 
because of this very complex, and I know you'll talk about it, the complex uh, issue, the difference between the way Israel controls the occupied territories and the way it controls Palestinian life inside Israel, this is something that did not fully existed in South Africa. And of course, a struggle in 1980 is not a struggle in 2016. Uh, and, and all these things are discussed in, in the book uh, in a way that, of course, is only the beginning of a journey. It's not the end of a journey. Many more research has to be done on uh, settler colonialism, anti-colonialism in Palestine. More research has to be done on comparing South Africa to Israel. But one thing we should not do, we should not regress back to the old conversation about this conflict as a conflict between two national movements, and one movement is democratic and the other one is less modern, one movement is Western, the other one is an Arab movement. We should not go back to this uh, awful uh, language that still is used by the main diplomacy and politics and academia and media in the West. We should insist on talking about Israeli apartheid, Israeli settler colonialism, Israeli ethnic cleansing, and we should not talk about peace and the end of occupation. We should talk about decolonization. We should all be part of an anti-colonialist movement that wants to decolonize this place for the sake of the native people and the settlers. And for that, we will also contribute something for the uh, peace and stability in the uh, uh, region as a whole. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to join Ilan in thanking the Educational Bookshop and the Institute for arranging tonight and hosting us here in this incredible garden. Um, as Ilan said, I'm going to take the case study of um, the Palestinian minority inside Israel. Ilan very kindly invited me to contribute a chapter on that. I assume I, he drew the short straw for me. Um, it's not so controversial anymore to suggest that there is an apartheid uh, system or regime operating in the occupied territories. We have a US president, Jimmy Carter, who has said this. Uh, when you get to that point, you know you're on re reasonably safe ground. But it's still controversial to suggest that uh, Israel, inside its own recognized, internationally recognized borders, is operating some kind of apartheid system, distinguishing, uh, discriminating against its Palestinian minority. And therefore, uh, I want to address some of, the, some of those issues, try and clarify some of this, the, these issues, as I did in, in the chapter, I hope. Um, one point I want to make is that what we see in the apartheid, uh, in the occupied territories, is something is apartheid, but as as Ilan is saying, settler colonialism leads to to um, apartheid-like systems. Or this elimination he's talking about, but it it doesn't mean that this is all that we see in the occupied territories. I think we could talk about apartheid plus there. What I want to talk about is whether there it's a fair analogy to talk about apartheid inside Israel, and I think it is. I actually think the apartheid comparison stands or falls not on whether there's apartheid in the occupied territories, but whether Israel is operating an apartheid system in its own territory against its Palestinian minority, 20% of the population inside Israel. We have a definition in international law, the UN's 1973 Convention on the Crime of Apartheid, and it refers to inhuman acts committed for the purpose of establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group of persons over any other racial group of persons and systematically oppressing them. In other words, to be an apartheid state or to have an apartheid system doesn't need to be exactly the same as apartheid in South Africa. Rather, there has to be some common or essential features Israel, as Rand Greenstein has noted, is a cousin, not a twin, of apartheid South Africa. Now, my chapter in the book argues that we have systematic oppression by Israel's Jewish majority of the Palestinian minority in most spheres of life. I'll go through some of those, uh, some of those areas uh, just to give you a sense of, of the, the scope. 
this isn't an exhaustive list by any means. We have two citizenship laws based on ethnic belonging, according each group different rights, especially in regards to immigration. We have national rights reserved for the Jewish but not for the Palestinian citizens of the state. And these national rights trump citizenship rights and institutionalized discrimination. We have no principle of equality enshrined in Israeli law, and that denies uh, Palestinians the chance to legally challenge the system of discrimination they face. We have land laws that reserve sovereignty over almost all of the land, 93% of it, to a global borderless Jewish nation rather than to Israeli citizens. We have segregation in residence and education that's designed to entrench ethnic identities, identity boundaries, and enforce systems of control. We have tight restrictions on the key resources of land and water enforced through the kibbutz and the mashav and the associated, associated uh, admissions committees to prevent Palestinians from engaging in commercial agriculture. Instead, they're being uh, consigned to the role of a, a dependent, casual labor force in most cases. We have segregated tribal politics that make political participation uh, for Palestinian citizens a charade, little more than window dressing, and that's been particularly underlined in the last week with this new expulsion law, um, which means that any Knesset member can be expelled from the, uh, from the parliament uh, if a uh, three-quarters majority take against their, their political views. We have law enforcement agencies that a judicial-led inquiry, the Or Commission in 2004, um, con uh, concluded it treated the Palestinian minority as uh, an enemy. We had vast swathes of the economy effectively off limits to Palestinians uh, because uh, national industries and the national infrastructure are defined as security sectors. We could go on and on and on with these, but you get the idea. So unlike South Africa, uh, Israel has worked much harder to veil all of this institutionalized and st systematic discrimination, humiliation, and oppression of its own citizens. The op occupied territories, it's a different matter. The veiling there is, 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 they're not so concerned about veiling. But in Israel, the issue is about veiling this, concealing it. And it's, been, it's done this um, to, to conceal the, the visible aspects of our apartheid. Now, in my chapter, I suggest that instead, uh, Israel has sought to create the illusion of visible equality as opposed to substantive or real equality. And I call that a confidence trick. And I think it rests on two pillars. These are, these are arguments you will often hear uh, Israel making when anybody raises this comparison that Israel is operating an apartheid system. The first one is that Israel's defenders will strenuously, strenuously object if a comparison is made with apartheid South, South Africa because they'll say, uh, that Israel does not prevent countries, P Jewish and Palestinian citizens, from mixing freely. Palestinian citizens, after all, can enter restaurants and cinemas in, Ju in Jewish areas. This claim is less true than Israel supporters would like us to believe, but let us concede for the moment that it is true. How relevant is this in deciding whether Israel is an apartheid state? Scholars of apartheid South Africa drew a distinction between two aspects of the regime, what they called petty or trivial apartheid and what's known as grand or resource apartheid. For most of us, the essence of South African apartheid was separate park benches, separate restaurants, separate toilets, separate restaurants, separate buses, and so on. But it, what, that wasn't the situation with the scholars. They noted that the main goal of apartheid was to restrict the benefits of the state's key resources, in the case of South Africa, that was the land, water, and the mineral wealth, to the white minority. In short, visible segregation was a particular form South African apartheid took, but the content of the apartheid system, its strategic objective, was related to resources, not park benches. There's a reason why academics refer to the visible features of South African apartheid as petty or trivial. Now, Israel has reserved land and water as economic resources to be exploited by uh, and for the Jewish population. As I mentioned earlier, 93% of the land is designated as belonging to a global Jewish nation, not the country's citizens. Water as a resource for use in agriculture is also reserved for Jews. Commercial agriculture and the cheap water it depends on are available only in Israel's hundreds of agricultural communities, the kibbutz and the moshav. 
There's also the so-called admissions committees that ensure only Jews can access these communities. Palestinians, are therefore, through these admissions committees, are excluded both from the land and from the water. So why has Israel been able to mostly discard uh, apartheid South Africa's petty or trivial features? In a black majority state like South Africa, enforced segregation was necessary because it created physical distance. It contributed to a sense of security. A, a white, small white minority craved as they ruled over a large black majority. Israel practices some visible segregation. It, there are separate living spaces, separate towns, uh, villages and communities, and also separate education systems. But it can sell these limited forms of segregation as lifestyle choices or even as respect for communal and cultural autonomy. In Israel, segregation is not primarily needed, as it was in South Africa, to preserve physical distance and security. Here it serves a different role, to create a sense of emotional separation between the Jewish and Palestinian populations. By keeping members of the two populations apart during their formative years, during childhood, it is possible to maintain and entrench a tribal and antagonistic on identity on both sides. Simply put, Israel does not want Jewish and Palestinian citizens to mix as children, otherwise they might create emotional bonds and connections that would undo the fear-inducing climate Israel has propagated. The second difference that uh, typically is cited by Israel supporters is that blacks, uh, blacks in South Africa were denied the vote, while Israel's Palestinian citizens have the same political rights as Jewish citizens. Again, this dis difference relates to the form of apartheid, uh, Israel and South Africa's separate apartheid, not to the substance. The different electoral considerations reflect the different demographic circumstances the two states found themselves in. Themselves in. in South Africa, oppressed uh, black population was, uh, was a large majority. In Israel, the Palestinian population is a relatively small minority. South Africa could, could not afford to give the vote to the black population because it would have risked, risked empowering them. Israel can give its Palestinian citizens a vote because absolutely no power accrues to them as a result. Those who oppose the apartheid comparison on these grounds are tricking us. They want us to overlook the historical context for Israel's generosity to its Palestinian citizens. The ethnic cleansing of 1948 that effectively gerrymandered Israel's political constituency in short, we're expected to ignore the fact that through mass expulsions in 1948, Israel engineered a state that would largely be free of Palestinians. A Jewish majority was made to order. Let us conduct a, a quick thought experiment. Let us imagine that South Africa managed to forcibly expel 80% of its black population to the Bantu stands, supposedly self-governing homelands. Let us imagine that it then forced the rump black minority, now living inside what had become a white majority area, into separate black-only communities, confined to a tiny proportion of the land and denied access to water and land and the key state's key resources. Let us imagine, too, that the regime then allowed the black minority to vote in elections to a white-dominated parliament and allowed blacks to eat alongside whites in restaurants in white majority areas. What would the international community have concluded about this situation? Would it have absolved South Africa of the crime of apartheid? Would it have claimed that there was no apartheid at all because white and black majorities ruled in their respective areas? Or would it have said that apartheid applied only in the Bantu stands because in those locations the black population did not have the vote? Or, more plausibly, I would argue, would it have considered that, conceded that South Africa had simply engineered a more convoluted system of apartheid and that the black minority living in majority, white majority areas were still as much victims of apartheid as those in the Bantu stands? In this thought experiment, analogous to the current situation in Israel, I think we would have little problem in understanding that the vote made little or no difference. The black population in white majority areas and in the Bantu stands suffered a, under a single apartheid regime. This point is more important, I think, than it may at first seem. If we accept the argument that Israel is practicing an apartheid only in the Bantu stands, or the occupied territories, then we give Israel license to claim that apartheid-like measures there may in fact be justifiable. By ignoring the unified nature of apartheid facing all Palestinians under Israeli rule, we give Israel the space to claim its policies in the occupied territories 
are driven by security considerations rather than the goal of systematic dispossession and, re and resource theft. If there's no apartheid in Israel, then maybe Israel is right that the regime it has created in the occupied territories is a necessary response to security threats rather than an integral part of an all-embracing apartheid system. I reject that idea. Rather, demonstrating that Israel is practicing apartheid inside its recognized borders is a vital step in confirming that it is also operating an apartheid regime, or worse, in the occupied territories. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Elan and Jonathan. Um, so I'm going to use my moderator's privilege and ask the first two questions, and then we'll open it up uh, to the floor. Elan, I wanted to ask you about Oren uh, Bendor's chapter, which I found a little bit difficult. Um, he seemed to... He seemed to... So, sorry, the chapter was called uh, Apartheid and the Question of Origin. And he seems to connect the Jewish question, the essence of Judaism, the principle of separateness and chosen people, etc., to Zionism, um, just, as, just as one manifestation of this. Could you perhaps comment uh, and elaborate a little on that? And then, for Jonathan... Um, I was wondering if you could give a comment on the Palestinian struggle inside Israel, one that for many years has sought to establish equality within the current system, um, and if the struggle is changing and evolving, um, and how successful has it been thus far? Thank you, uh, Yara. Uh, as an editor, you usually uh, have a responsibility to allow articles that also you don't totally agree with. I don't think an editor of a collection needs to agree with every point that is being made. Uh, Oren Bendor, I don't know if many people know who he is, uh, is an Israeli who left Israel many, many years ago. He teaches philosophy at the University of Southampton. And uh, in his article, uh, he repeats in many ways uh, the ideas that some of you who are old enough or have read enough uh, would recognize uh, some of the ideas that the Israeli uh, human rights uh, uh, activist Israel Shachak has already mentioned in his books. Uh, both scholars, Shachak uh, and uh, Bendor, re see the policies of Israel, and before that, the policies of Zionism, towards the Palestinians as also emanating from the Jewish religion, not just as I have tried in my introduction tonight, to say that it comes from the settler colonialist reality, not from a certain religion uh, as such. Um, one of the interesting things is, if, I, I don't agree with it, by the way, but one of the interesting things is, of course, if I had an article in a book about uh, Islam, and someone would have written, someone would have written that uh, a certain Islamic or group, certain group, doesn't have to be even Islamic, is very violent or is doing uh, uh, or acting criminally and is inspired by Islam, my publisher, my editor, my listeners would not even raise a question. They would see such uh, a style as totally natural. Of course, you can say, Probably these people were inspired by Islam, or they are violent because they believe in Islam. Of course, if you do it for Judaism, you are on a slippery slope. But that doesn't mean it's, it's, uh, it's, a, valid, uh, it's a valid accusation. I don't know if you noticed uh, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, the, the leader, hopefully the long-lasting leader, of the British Labour Party, uh, said that blaming Netanyahu for his policies, bl sorry, blaming all the Jews in the world for Netanyahu's policies is like blaming the Islamic, the, all the Muslims in the world for the Islamic State. And uh, he was immediately branded as one of the worst anti-Semites uh, uh, living today. So th that's one of the contexts of allowing a, a, an article that claims that Judaism provides justification for apartheid ideologies. On the other hand, monotheistic religions uh, 
can easily justify not just apartheid, they can justify genocide, they can justify separating one's head from the body by one centimeter, which is usually enough. It, it can justify so many things that uh, I thought, why not legitimize someone who thinks that Judaism can be analyzed in the same way that Christianity and Islam, Islam is. Uh, I have to say that one publisher did not allow us to publish the book because of that article, and we should congratulate that publication who knew exactly what would wait them in the corner, wait them in the corner for being courageous enough to allow such a discussion. It is an important discussion uh, whether we agree or, or don't agree with it. This issue of, of Palestinians inside Israel and the, and the, um, the connections and uh, sympathies of the struggle with Palestinians in the occupied territories, it might be worth just running through here a little bit of the, uh, the history of Palestinians inside Israel. Because when we, something I didn't mention then, but it, I think it's worth thinking about, is if, is that me or something else? Um, one of the, the things that's worth remembering when we think about uh, the early years of the Palestinians inside Israel, they were under a military government the first 18 years or so. And so when we're thinking about this idea of uh, apartheid here, if we, if we can see, like Jimmy Carter, that there's apartheid in the occupied territories, we have to remember that for the first 18 years, Palestinians were living under exactly or possibly worse system than we see in the occupied territories today or in the West Bank. They couldn't move out of their, their towns and villages without a permit from the military governor. They were locked down, absolutely. Freedom, freedom of movement was just non-existent in those times, you know, relative to what we see in the occupied territories now. And the Palestinians there have, have a lot of freedom of movement compared to the Palestinians in the early years. So we have a bit of a problem if we think that the Palestinians inside Israel in the early years, if we think that, that apartheid doesn't apply, well, what was going on then? What we've seen is just a... a, a, a a gradual loosening of the, the ties of apartheid that were, as I mentioned in, in, in my talk, were, were related to, to the specific circumstances Israel finds itself in. The fact it has a minority rather than a majority, and it doesn't have this need for physical security in the way that white South Africans had. So this, the, sorry, this probably sounds like, a, I'm not getting to your point, but I will get to it in a minute, because what changes then after 67 with the occupation is, these, uh, this system breaks down, in it, or, or rather the apartheid-like nature of the military government is exported into the occupied territories. And now we, it seems we're, we're relatively comfor comfortable with the idea that there's an apartheid in the West Bank. But even though that system was set up and it was established inside Israel and then is exported, we some somehow think that it, it doesn't seem applicable in the case of Palestinians inside Israel. Now what happens then is, after the green line is effectively raised, after the occupation begins, Palestinians who have been very much locked down under this military government have the chance to reconnect with families living in the West Bank. And so there's the, these family, familial connections, political connections start to re-emerge. Now what we're seeing happening now is, is a reversal back to the military government in many ways. So we're seeing the I would even argue what, what this, this system that was exported into the occupied territories, the military government, is kind of starting to creep back inside Israel. And that since the, the wall, fence, whatever you want to call it, uh, has created this, this separation again, Israel is, is faced back with the problems it, in many ways it started with in 1948, how to deal with this Palestinian Achilles heel inside Israel. Okay, we've got the, the, the thing sorted out in the, in the occupied territories. This is a security threat. They're terrorists. We need uh, physical protection from them. But we have this Achilles heel. We have this Trojan horse. All of this, this terminology, isn't, it's not stuff I'm making up. This is, Israeli leaders use this all the time. You'll hear every prime minister has used this kind of terminology, this idea of fifth column, Achilles heel, a Trojan horse. The problem is we have this weakness. We have this cancer. This is another term that's often used inside us. So the Palestinians in Israel start to become a weak point in this system of, uh, of apartheid you've created. Because you, it, it, the, the, in, a, in, a, in a world where we're, we, we, there's 24-hour rolling news, the, the social media, where everybody has a, a camera in their phone, the way you treat your people is much, it's much more open. It's much harder to conceal what you're doing. And so Palestinians in Israel 
what we're seeing with this expulsion law, now the NGO law, all these series of, of, of laws, we're seeing a sort of gradual reintroduction, I think, of the military government. This environment is coming back. And this means that you're seeing an increasing political... Um, the circumstances Palestinians find themselves in on either side of the Green Line is increasingly starting to look similar. Palestinians inside Israel had a kind of incentive to keep their head down, or have done, because they can look to the occupied territories and see things are worse there. We don't want to be in that situation. But I think that's starting to be undone. Israel is undoing that. That's the logic of settler colonialism and the apartheid, unified kind of apartheid system we have. So what's happening, I think, is that we're seeing Palestinians inside Israel particularly aware of this apartheid-like structure. And we've seen debates going on among the political elites in the Pal among the Palestinians inside Israel, talking increasingly, admittedly still behind the scenes because of the circumstances they find themselves in. I mean, it's fairly, you know, the boycott law and all these things, it's very difficult to talk about a lot of stuff politically now inside Israel without breaking the law. But Palestinian leaders inside Israel are talking very much more in terms of how do we deal with this reality, political reality? How, uh, how much can we hang on to the idea of a, a, a two-state solution when it's not going to happen? Um, and what kind of relations are, can we have with Palestinians in the occupied territories? And actually, I think the Palestinians inside Israel in many ways have been leading that kind of debate and discussion that we need to stop thinking in the kind of fragmented political uh, Bantu stands that have been created for us by Israel. There's a reluctance to do it because it, there's because of all the difficulties that will be entailed by it. But I think the, the, there's a lot of strategizing going on right now about what do we do, how do we reestablish these connections. We have, uh, just to take one example, one of the big fears now for Palestinians inside Israel is that um, that Mahmoud Abbas, or whoever follows him, will sign up to this idea of Israel being a Jewish state. And this, this is now a central part of, a, of the peace process. Every time Netanyahu talks about some illusory peace process, the issue of the central issue now seems to be that the Palestinians must recognize Israel as a Jewish state. The Palestinians inside Israel realize how dangerous that is for him. That's the Palestinians signing, signing up to apartheid inside Israel. So they're very nervous about that. They have an interest in trying to make sure the Palestinians in the occupied territories understand their situation and connect to them that way. So I actually think we're seeing increasing um, sympathy uh, between the, the, the political movements in both places. And I don't, it's still early times, but I think we're going to see this happening more and more and strategizing together. The Knesset members, Palestinian Knesset members, I know, spend a lot of time in the occupied territories talking to people there. So joint strategies are starting to be considered, worked on, admittedly behind the scenes at the moment. But the logic of this is going to drive Palestinians on both sides of the Green Line to making stronger connections and strategizing more and more. Great. Thank you very much. So I'm going to open the, the floor now. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a roving mic, so if you're at the back, I'll ask you to come forward and maybe I'll repeat the question. I'm going to take three at a time as well. So we have a gentleman at the back, and uh, there's one here, and then also the man... Yeah. Um, if you can keep your questions... If you can keep your questions uh, super short, because uh, there's a lot of people that want to um, want to have a dis discussion. So super short questions. Thank you. Actually, my name is Walid Salim, so my seeing Elan was uh, a long time since 1997 when we met in the conference. So in any way, I, I agree 95% of what you said, uh, but he, uh, here are my short three comments, very short ones. Uh, one is the problem today is not about two national movements s uh, struggling or conflicting with each other about the overall Palestine. They are conflicting about West Bank. This is the question. The question now is the conflict with the two sides is about uh, West Bank. Because the wisdom of Oslo between the brackets was that considering West Bank, Gaza Strip, and this Jerusalem to be area under dispute. So therefore, the Israelis can come and claim we have rights in Jerusalem, we have rights in Al Haram al Ibrahim in Hebron, we have the tomb of Rachel in Bethlehem. Joseph Tomb in Nablus, whatever. So the idea is the conflict about this. Now this is the position of the international community. 
And this is the way that the Americans run the negotiations. Under this umbrella, what's going now in West Bank is not apartheid. It's beyond. It's more than apartheid. It's apartheid plus conflict plus ethnic cleansing, which we talked about. The logic of elimination is, is, is already there. And now, actually, the issue now should not be about if we should revive the peace process or not. The issue should be about how to prevent another elimination of Palestinians, another transfer. This is what they are preparing to. Already, Ori Ariel spoke about taking the Palestinians out of Area C. He spoke about it in the Knesset, and there are discussions about it. So we are in the age of elimination, and as Nahum Chomsky said in his book, Faithful, The Faithful Triangle, the issue is how to prevent the new elimination of Palestinians. My final point about Palestinian National Movement. What you said about the Palestinian National Movement, that they consider the uh, uh, considered colonial project more than settlers one, and I think you are partially right. But there is another part of it. When Fatih spoke about secular democratic state, and Nayef Hawatmi spoke in 1968 about binational state, and George Habash spoke about social democratic state, they did not speak about hatred to Jews. They were talking about, we consider Jews that agree with us in positions. So they did not discriminate against Jews as being Jews. They discriminate against Jews who's, who are Zionists, not the Jews who want to accept living with Palestinians in secular state or by national state or social state. So I have this. So you are partially right, but this is the other part. Thank you very much. Thank and you. hope to see you again. <laughs> Thank you for two fascinating uh, uh, accounts on what is happening. I have a question to um, uh, Ilan Pape. Um, as a, a learned sociologist uh, turned diplomat, I'm very much interested in uh, the dialogue between concepts and political prescriptions. I don't think that um, a di uh, that, that um, uh, analysis is politically innocent. And um, I fully uh, understand um, analytically where you go uh, in describing this conflict as a, as a settler colonialist um, uh, enterprise. Um, and um, I know that describing it just as national two national movements um, is very simplistic. Um, now, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict can be describe, described in, very, in, in many ways. It can be described as a two national movements. It can be described the way you did it. It can also be described, uh, rightly or wrongly, and I think the article you just made allusion to uh, possibly makes that connection, as a religious conflict. Um, it might also be described as a proxy conflict uh, between the international uh, big players. And it's not a surprise that um, um, 91 and 93 happened after the breakdown uh, of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. It opened up new issues, and we, we tend to forget that at the time of the Cold War, the Israelis and the Palestinians were standing on two sides of, of, the, of, of the dividing line, and it was very much also a proxy conflict. So analytically, you can basically um, um, describe the conflict in, in many, many ways. Now, the question is, what does that do in the political arena? And I would, uh, I would, I would agree with you that describing um, uh, the issue as two national movements competing with each other over a territory might be very simplistic, but it offers a way out. And this is what I call a contrafactual description of the conflict. And um, we still stick in diplomacy to this description of the conflict because we know how to solve a territorial conflict. You draw a line, the one goes to the left, the one, and we know we're simplistic about it, but we keep to it because that allows us basically to, to um, address the conflict politically. If we address it as a religious conflict, which it might be, then you're in the Sam Huntington world and the clash of civilization, then it is about building walls and digressing and, and war on terror and all these kind of issues. And if you listen to Saeb Erikat analyzing, he says what Netanyahu is trying these days is to transform a territorial conflict into a, into a religious one. And then it becomes intractable and un addressable actually and also the proxy issue um, um, you can you can have a, a, a kind of political dimension my question to you is with regard to the settler colonialism what is the kind of political um, territory it leads us to because if I understand you correctly that goes beyond the two-state solution and I can tell you from the discussions I'm having with the Palestinians that they're not ready yet to go there they still want to have the rights of self-determination 
exercised in an own state. And we have delivered this promise more than 20 years ago, and I think we have, we have still to deliver on that promise. Um, the Palestinians to whom I talk um, are possibly fascinated by the, by the intellectual idea, but they don't know where to put it politically. And my question would be to you, or actually it's not a question, it's just an observation, but I think we need to reflect what that would mean politically in the political arena. And sorry for politicizing academic debate, but I think the, the connections are quite obvious. Um, thank you. Uh, my question, uh, Ilan, was about the point that you made uh, that the Palestinian National Movement uh, never articulated a clear vision what it wants to do with the settler colonialists who came here. I'm not sure I got the point because the PLO Charter is perfectly clear whereby everybody is supposed to live here together. That was their, res their national response to the threat that came about. Uh, and it seems to me that if and when uh, logic prevails that uh, everybody will live here together, be it Christian, Muslim, or Jew, or, or other. Uh, so it seems that then we will go back to the scenario that existed before the Zionist movement. And, uh, that will uh, spell some kind of uh, equitable resolution. But the Palestinians did articulate something as far as I know. I'm not sure what you were trying to say, actually. That was my question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would you like to take those? Yeah, I'll take them. And then maybe shortly. we'll have some questions from some women. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, l let me start with the uh, first uh, um, uh, comments. And thank you. They were very important. Uh, I, I do agree that uh, in the life of the Palestinian uh, nation, uh, there are groups that at the given moment are in much greater danger than other groups. Uh, the people in Gaza are probably are much more under danger than even the people in the West Bank. And uh, it is very difficult to combine uh, a struggle that is urgent with a struggle that is long-term. And usually we say historically that people who, have to, people who have to struggle daily against elimination don't have the luxury to strategize. They, have the luxury, they don't have the luxury. All they can do is make sure, that, as you say, that the, disaster, the next disaster maybe can be prevented. And I think for this, at least the community of activists found a partial solution the BDS movement. I think boycott, divestment, and sanction of the state of Israel is exactly response to this. This is not a strategy for a solution. It is saying to the world, while we are thinking how to solve this issue, we want to stop the criminal Israeli policy on the ground because the diplomats, the governments, are too frightened to do this. Ah, they shut my microphone, the, mic. the government. <laughs> This is an official institution here. Okay, I hope you heard it. They are afraid to be called anti-Semitic. They are afraid about their strategic interest in Israel, their economic interest in Israel. So we in the civil society took the lead. We will turn Israel into a pariah state. I don't care. We will, when one mic isn't working, there's always another one. We will turn Israel into a pariah state because that's the only way of sending a message to the Israelis that even if politicians are afraid to exert pressure on them, their electorate in this age of democracy and transparency are not afraid to do this. And you're right, the West Bank is under a great danger because the vision of Israel, which has nothing to do with the two-state solution, the vision of Israel, of this government, and the consensus of Israeli political map is to annex Area C to Israel, to create a small Gaza in Area A and B, and they are quite right in thinking that the European Union and the United States and Russia would give it a blessing as a two-state solution if the Palestinian Authority would go with it. And it, it might go with it. I wouldn't be totally surprised if it does not. So uh, I, I do agree with you. Now, the second point, which also was raised in the, uh, by the third commentator, about uh, uh, the PLO. The, the problem with historians is that they remember documents by heart. The PLO Charter of 1968 said that only the Jews that arrived until the beginning of the Zionist Razu, which is probably invasion, 
Only the Jews who came until the Zionist invasion can stay. This is a bit problematic in 2016. First of all, all the Jews who came until the Zionist invasion are gone. Some of them in hell, rightly so. Maybe some of them in paradise. But one thing is clear, they're not here anymore. Okay? So there is a need for a new Palestinian thinking. The PLO Charter is irrelevant to 2016 in this respect. It is relevant in some of its clauses, of course, the democratic state for all and so on. But do remember Article 6 that says that the Palestinians, that the Jews who arrived after, some say they mean 1882, some say they mean 1914, who arrived after that day should go back to their homelands. This is where we need a new Palestinian message, and we haven't heard that Palestinian message. Uh, as for uh, the points of the, which are very important, there are two issues here that are very important. One is, what is the motive behind an analytical paradigm? I can see, uh, I have this argument, I wrote two books with Noam Chomsky, because I think he genuinely believes that the paradigm of two-state solution is a reasonable solution. So I don't suspect his motives. I think he's wrong, but I don't suspect his motives. But the main actor that wants to implement two-state solution is Israel. And I do suspect its motive, whether it's the Labour Party, whether it's merits, whether it is the Likud. The two-state solution for them is a modern-day ploy of the settler colonial state to complete the settler colonialist project. The way they want to complete it is by area A and B as a Bantustan, Gaza as a Bantustan, and the Palestinian citizens in Israel as a second-rate citizens. That's the Israeli vision of peace and reconciliation. Now, if you want to bring a counter-interpretation to what the two-state solution is doing, you have been trying to do it in the last, since 1967, and nothing happened for very good reason, because what really matters is not the EU interpretation of the two-state solution, not even the American interpretation of the two-state solution, but the Israeli interpretation of the two-state solution. So if you don't identify Israel as the obstacle for peace, which nobody does in, the, in high politics, there's no chance for any genuine two-state solution to emerge. In the meantime, anyway, on the ground, the reality has rendered this solution Impossible. Final point, and with this, it's end because it, it's very important. You said and, that the Palestinians are not ready yet for the one-state solution, and you asked me what is the political solution. Of course, it's the one-state solution in my mind. One of the charades and fabrication of the discourse of the two-state solution, of the paradigm of the two national movements fighting for the same piece of land, is that the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah is the representative of the Palestinian people. And they, of course for them, territory is important. Is territory important to the Palestinian refugees? Has territory anything to do with the Palestinian right of return? Is territory anything to do with the rights of the Palestinian citizens of Israel? Nothing. It has nothing to do with territory. It has to do with the right of people who were expelled by a settler colonialist movement to come back to their home. It's not about territory only. It's about colonizing a homeland, expelling the people, and re reframing the relationship between the settlers and the natives on a different basis. If this basis goes through two-state solution, okay. It, do, it doesn't matter. I don't think it can go through that two-state solution. The, the solution is dead. It's in the morgue. We just didn't get the invitation for the funeral. Um, so three more questions. Um... From, I'm only taking from women. Um, sorry. This this lady on the in this side. Yep. Uh, anyone on this side? Yep. You. And there's a woman at the back, and I'll do another round of questions. <laughs> Uh, I'm a Palestinian from Jerusalem, therefore my, uh, my issue is uh, uh, Jerusalem. <laughs> and uh, I think, um, I don't want to speak on behalf of many Jerusalemites, but uh, 
uh, we we tend to be more uh, uh, inspired by a uh, binational state because again of Jerusalem because of uh, the architectural uh, uh, cohesion the social uh, and because I happen also to have a house uh, in uh, in Uziah Street in uh, Bakka. So uh, and this issue is not at all addressed neither by the by the Israelis clearly <laughs> they won't address this, this issue nor by Palestinians unfortunately so one has to work uh, on uh, on her own on his own to uh, to uh, uh, try and follow the justice uh, uh, if uh, one day it can prevail um, this is uh, an observation. My question uh, is, um, I, I would like very much to listen to your message. Uh, and because I, I was for many years and many, many other Palestinians were peace activists and there is no peace activism anymore today. Uh, how do you think and um, how do you think one should go about this message? And whether uh, we should go, you know, along uh, uh, having like uh, creating, uh, establishing campaigns, etc. Uh, and uh, perhaps the precise question I have is whether we have a partner on the Israeli side, uh, because uh, while we we feel very very much that we uh, we are thirsty of uh, peace activism, it's very ironic today that one has to work either on boycotting or. Uh, being indifferent and in all uh, all messages that uh, we have and the feeling that we have and uh, living every day under occupation you feel as a Palestinian at least I feel uh, there's something missing if I'm not in activism uh, however I feel that there is also no Israeli partner anymore so I'd like to listen to to that please thank you very much There was another woman at the back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, hi, Ellen. Uh, thanks very much for the presentation. I have a question which relates more to your answer to the first uh, question. <coughs> and, and you presented very eloquently the case for apartheid, uh, yet you avoid very elegantly the... Uh, the mechanism that makes this apartheid possible. I mean, black in South Africa, you could be white and black, and that gave you the, this made the segregation. When Owen Bender, I haven't read you his article yet, but I'm sure this is what he points out. We are living in what is called a Jewish society. The only uh, mechanism that uh, accords people like you and myself uh, the right to be, to have the privileges uh, all these uh, crazy uh, linguistic inventions like uh, we are eligible by the law of return, whereas other people may be uh, present absentees. Everything, when you look back, it goes back to the Jewish religion. It goes everywhere, goes to uh, the uh, decrees, and you, it, at the end of the road, there's always a rabbi telling you what religion and what group you belong to. Uh, so it, it sounds very strange this, uh, you know, this uh, politically correct way, we're not talking about religion, it's not a religious war. Of course, a, the Spanish Inquisition as well as the Islamic State are bad examples of what religion does to politics, but the Jewish state is a bad idea as well, and I don't really understand why we should avoid it. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a short comment and a question about education that you mentioned. Uh, the comment is that in Israel there are no two separate systems of education. There is one system of education in which there is segregation. And I think this is different. Because the Palestinian Israelis don't have their own system. They are controlled by the Jewish system. And all the committees that decide upon their education are made primarily of Jews, like five against two Arabs, and they study the same books that Jews study about the Zionist project and Jewish history, and they never study anything about themselves and their own. And I think this is something that should uh, 
uh, incriminate Israel in a crime that is not yet recognized as a crime of uh, sociocide, which is part of apartheid. My question is, uh, do you know how it was done in South Africa in that respect? <laughs> You know, do I know? <laughs> <laughs> what was done in South Africa? I didn't know that. Education. Oh, the education. Yeah. So the second thing. You know. Anyway, okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll start with. So, so I'll just say something about education. Yeah, education, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that we used the last. Yeah. Go on. I'll, I'll just, I'm just going to respond to that point. I'm, I, I'm not an expert on the, the edu education system in uh, South Africa, but I assume it was segregated on in, in many ways the in the same way you can use the same rationale as, you, as occurs in Israel which is based on I mean it's a, a pretext of course but the idea that of, if you have separate residents if people are living in different areas spaces then you can segregate based on that you say well you're living in different areas therefore you have to have separate schools um, but there's interestingly Israel I think has tried to create also this idea that there's some kind of uh, creating a separate education system for its Palestinian citizens uh, is some kind of uh, cultural autonomy. I mean, it, of course, it doesn't use that term, and it isn't, um, but there's this kind of implication in terms of the public relations of it. Well, of course, they should have their own separate education system, they have their own language, and so on. But as you rightly point out, it, the, the system is entirely controlled uh, by Jewish officials, and we see, we see it in this whole question that's just come up about Mahmoud Darwish, poetry, not being allowed, um, even on the radio, for Israeli Jews, let alone for Palestinians, of course. Um, but what's interesting, one of the, the, the points I wanted to make is that, and this is coming back to this uh, difficulty that Palestinians inside Israel are facing because we're getting this military government kind of ethos returning, is that uh, I was recently writing about the fact that uh, the Palestinian leadership inside Israel are div starting to develop their own educational program. In history, yeah, this is they're, they're, they're developing a new uh, curriculum that they're writing. They're writing the, the textbooks. It's a response to this whole problem with the civics program that Israel has now created this new civics program, which ignores Palestinians entirely. I mean, it's always in, marginalized them, uh, grossly marginalized them, but now it, they're, they're almost entirely excluded from the civics program as though they don't exist. Um, and so the response, this has forced Palestinians into a very difficult situation. How can you teach a, a civics curriculum? It's the only one that's joined. It's the only one that where the same textbooks are used. How can you teach a civics curriculum where you're, you don't exist? I mean, you're just, uh, you know, Ilan's talked about memory side and so on. I mean, but this is actually going on as you are there. It's not about history lesson. You're actually just not present in the classroom. So what they're doing now is coming up with their own program, their own curriculum. They're devising it, writing their own textbooks, and they're starting with the civics program, but they're going to work after that. They're developing a history curriculum and so on. That's the plan. And it's been approved by the Higher Follow-up Committee, which is the main body for political body for the Palestinians inside Israel. You, looks like you want to... Uh, first, Huda, thank you for, for, for your comments. Uh, is there a partner? Uh, I think that's why I think uh, the book is very interesting. There's an article by Amne Badran in the book that compares uh, the Peace Now movement in Israel and the white uh, movement that supported the ANC in South Africa. And it's very clear that if you accept the definition of a peace camp in Israel, because you accept the analysis that there are two national movements, and peace will be by creating two peace movements on both sides. We know, we've tried it. Uh, what happens uh, when two peace groups of Israelis and Palestinians meet? They speak in Hebrew, they think in Zionism, and they get a lot of money from Europe for nothing. Uh, when you think about the white people who supported the ANC, they were much smaller than a proper peace camp, but at least you knew exactly where they stood. Uh, your partners among the Jewish society in Israel currently are very numerous. There are not many of them, but they are growing in number. And I still insist that if we continue to talk about the two-state solution, about the Oslo process, the peace process, and so on, 
we will never increase the number of Israeli Jews who could be our partners. Uh, it's a long-term process. And uh, as you probably, one of the uh, contributors in South Africa, or from South Africa to the book says, I think it's uh, Steve Friedman, he says, when apartheid fell in South Africa, 95% of the whites were still racist and supported apartheid. In order to create a different reality, you can't deprogram every racist uh, Zionist. Uh, uh, but uh, you, if you have a significant minority that understands the settler colonial reality, understand that the only way forward is decolonization, then you can hope for a different uh, role. But we are, according, uh, li like the Jewish joke that I keep repeating, because of the way the international community frames the conflict with the help of its academics, politicians, diplomats, we are looking for a key that we have lost where there is light, under the lamp. We have forgotten where the key has been lost. And this is what we are doing. We really, uh, 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 that's the way uh, forward. The, the uh, uh, Ofra's uh, remark, um, I, I'm, I finished now a, a new book. Uh, where is uh, Muna? Uh, I'm here. Make sure that there is another space in your shelf, uh, <laughs> which is called The Ten Myths of Israel. And the third myth is that Zionism is Judaism. Mm. I don't want to accept it. As a Jew, I don't want to accept that Judaism and Zionism is the same. And I agree with Wali when he said that Palestinians had no problem with living with Jews. They had problem with living with Zionists. Not every Jew is a Zionist. Not every interpretation of Judaism is Zionism. In fact, historically, Zionism was a secular movement. And, and I used to say, I, hope, I always like to repeat this, that Zionism was a secular movement that did not believe in God, but believed that God promised them Palestine. Nonetheless, <laughs> this, this is the... Of course there are rabbis, and of course there is a Jewish interpretation now of Zionism which makes it much worse. A combination of nationalism and religion is frightening. But that doesn't mean that religion is being to be blamed or nationalism is being to be blamed. It's the combination that is working there. So I think that uh, talking about the difference between Zionism and Judaism is one step further in the right direction that takes us also out of the wrong paradigm. The problem here is not between Jews and Muslims and Christians. The problem here is between settlers, the, the last settler colonialist project that is still allowed to be openly a settler colonialist project is Palestine. No other uh, uh, community in the world is allowed. Maybe they are doing it, but they are not accepted, they are not being absolved. And Above all this, moreover, this settler colonial project is still declared the only democracy uh, in the Middle East. So we have a lot of work uh, to, to do uh, here. Okay, so I'll, I'll open the floor again to all genders. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we have a lady at the back there. This one I promised earlier as well, and the gentleman over there. Hi, um, thank you so much for all the thoughts that you've shared. Um, my question is uh, specifically for Elon. Yeah. Um, so my question is on um, Jewish identity specifically, and it actually relates to what you were just talking about. Um, so as we see here in Israel, it's almost integral to the existence of the state that the idea of Jewish and state can be seen as one. And somehow the idea of diaspora thus becomes illegitimate. And so my question is, how, how do we begin to break this down, deconstruct this both in theory and in practice, to create more space for criticizing the existence of the state and also creating space for new alternatives? Thank uh, you. Okay, can I? Yeah. Okay, I'm South African. I grew up in apartheid South Africa, and now I live here in Palestine. 
To answer Nuri's question first about education, we had four different education systems, one for the white race, one for the black race, one for the Asian race, and one for the colored race. I'm an Asian South African. I, we questioned the history. The history we were taught in school was that it was a land without a people, and because the blacks disseminated one another in, in Southern Africa, and the colonials came in for an empty land. And that's the history we were taught. And from, I remember very clearly, we, 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 we rebelled against that. It resulted in the Soweto rights in 1976 about education. And the history we were taught right from primary school all the way to high school, the Great Trek, where the colonials, the settlers went from Cape Town all the way, the Great Trek. And we said this trek took a long, long time. Anyway, just to answer your question, there were four different systems. And different amounts of money were spent on the different systems. Whites got the biggest chunk of the uh, budget, and the blacks got the least. Okay, we Asians got a little more than the coloreds. Uh, I mean, but that's how the whole system was, was designed. And we had, uh, I mean, you know, the Soweto rights resulted. Okay, coming back to, I haven't read the book, but just as a South African, I came here in 2003 to Palestine as South Africa's first uh, representative to the Palestinian Authority. My view of the Palestinian issue at that stage was slanted, obviously from coming from South African apartheid and being on the Palestinian side of the conflict. Then I left, it's a long story why I left, or I was kicked out. I was kicked out simply because I made the mistake of saying it's worse than apartheid. And it's, I have a court case going with the South African government which has been going on from the year 2005 until today. And I'm writing a book about that. That's another story. Anyway, I came back in uh, 2000 and uh, was it it's six here. Yeah. And we opened up a radio station, the first ever English radio station to try and get both sides to talk. I think you remember that, 93.6 Ram FM. I was the consultant on the program, and then I interviewed uh, Professor Pape many times on my program. I ended up becoming the morning talk show to talk between the two sides. And I learned then that both sides are stuck on certain narratives, and nobody wants to hear the truth. Anyway, the radio station got closed down, and today, uh, I'm a Palestinian wannabe now, married to a Palestinian, I live here. And talking about South Africa and apartheid and here, I have some issues myself. Um, I, it's far, initially I said, it's, I said it's worse than apartheid. Today I would say if South Africa invented apartheid, Israel perfected it. And I would like to write a book about that. Thank you. Hi. Um, my question is maybe to both of you. It was just, um, so one of the main differences between South African apartheid and the current apartheid here is uh, the fragmentation of the Palestinian population. So there's a big uh, Palestinian diaspora, the refugee population, West Bank and Gaza, um, and the very effective Bantustan. So I was wondering, how do you think this difference impacts on the struggle for the decolonization of Palestine, and in what terms would... Um, addressing it, how would, the ter how would it be formulated, um, addressing this issue? He's, tur he's turned off my microphone. Uh, I just wanted to say another, one other thing about, the, you were talking about the education. I think education is really an interesting aspect um, as a, a system of control. Um, but also as part of this fragmentation process. And um, one of the, it was interesting to hear that you had those different uh, systems, the, the, the black, colored, and so on, system in uh, South Africa. Because one of the things that Israel has done is also created these different kinds. Of, we talk about an Arab education system, but actually we have uh, streams within that. We have a separate Druze education system 
the Druze here are considered a, a separate nationality to get their own education system. And I would argue, um, nobody else is really making this point yet, but I would argue we're just about to get an Aramaic education system. Um, so Israel is really breaking down inside Israel. The, it's actually, and this relates, I suppose, to the religious question as well. We had once upon a time these nationalities uh, of Jewish and Arab, and, and a little bit the Druze as well. And now we're getting the situation where we have a Jews, uh, sorry, Jewish nationality, we have an Arab nationality, we have a Druze nationality, and now we have an Aramaic nationality. And Aramaic is just another way of dressing up a Christian nationality. It's kind of the, the, the old Christian identity, pre-Arab identity. And w I noticed that Israel is trying to shut down the 50 or so church schools that exist. These are schools that were run by Christian orders before Israel's creation. Um, we have them in, a lot of them in Nazareth, but they're dotted around historic Palestine in most of the cities like Haifa and Lid and Ramli and Jaffa and so on. And Israel is suffocating them, it's starving them of funds, refusing to let the parents even top up the, the money that's been taken away by the government. And it's saying, well, there's a solution to this, which is that they can become state schools. Now, I, I have this sneaking suspicion that Israel, once it shuts these down, will reopen them as Aramaic schools. I mean, it would be logical, because they, they have this Christian ethos about them anyway. Turn them into Aramaic schools. Now, what did Israel do with the Druze education system? It used it as a way to create this narrative, and this also brings me back to the point to our friend from South Africa. It created this narrative for, with the Druze in the Druze education system that there was a joint project. I mean, it's not so difficult to do it. The Jews were expelled from Egypt. So were the Druze. Um, you can create this idea of a common destiny and use this to uh, recruit a population, a group like the Druze, to serve in the army. And they're encouraged to, and they have to, they're drafted into the army. And my fear is that education will be used here inside Israel. We're on the cusp of this. And again, brings us back again to this point I'm making about the, the military government returning, uh, that we're going to see Palestinian Christians being forced into Aramaic schools as a prelude to their indoctrination to get them to serve in the army, as a way to turn them against uh, the Muslim Palestinian majority inside Israel. This a policy of divide and rule that we've seen going on for a long time. So th these divisions that we see between the Bantu stands, between West, you know, the areas A, B, and C of the West Bank, East Jerusalem, Gaza, Palestinians inside Israel, Israel is also constantly refining and developing these divisions within these Bantu stands. So there are further and further divisions. And it tried this at the very beginning of the project. In the early years under the military government, it was trying to turn the Palestinians, it didn't even call them Israeli Arabs as it does today, it called them the minorities, and thought about them in terms, primarily in sectarian terms. And it seems to me Israel is doing this as well. It's, it's now trying to break down even this Arab identity. Of course, it, it's so reluctant to give them a recognized a Palestinian identity, but it's also now trying to break down the Arab identity back into these minorities. So we're seeing a, a sort of circle be coming back here, um, which I think is worth noting. Uh, and I think as the Palestinians inside Israel, sometimes it worries me that they're a little bit slow on, 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 not the uptake, but it, it, they're not suspicious enough. I, I feel I'm more suspicious on this. I'm the one saying, these, why are they shutting down these church schools, isn't this? And, and they're bringing in this Aramaic identity. And we've got the first Aramaic school in Jish now, which is north of, uh, of Nazareth. Um, why do they want to shut down these 50 Christian schools and then reinvent them as state schools if it's not to turn them into Aramaic schools? And then if they turn them into Aramaic schools, what, why do, would they want to do that? apart from trying to do what they did with the Druze in the 50s, which is turn Palestinian Christians... I mean, already they received these draft notices. It's just they're voluntary at the moment. There's a, the, it's important to join these dots up and to be hyper-suspicious of what's going on. Assume the worst, because the worst is often what Israel seems to have in store. And the point you were making about the, the, the South African system uh, having all these different streams even you know, that the, the were there, I think we can see something similar going on inside Israel as, as well. And it's, it, as I, say, I keep wanting to say, I feel the military government is coming back. I think this is an important point. Yeah. Uh, first question, I hope I got it right. You are, how would you construct the diaspora relationship with the state, in a way? Okay, okay. So I'll, I'll try and answer. I think I understand. I'm not sure. But uh, 
Tell me if I'm not going at all in the right way. Talking about Sweden or something. Um, okay. Uh, I, I think that uh, there the are certain uh, associations uh, and vested interests in Israel and Palestine which are harmful for the chances of people who live here to live in peace in normal life. One association is the association of the Jewish world with the state of Israel. The, 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 if we can somehow divorce uh, uh, the Jewish question from the Zionist question and say that Jewish communities around the world don't have vested interest here, they're not partners to the discussion, and bring back the refugees which the peace process, the Palestinian Authority, everyone has taken out of the conversation. If we can replace the refugees as a legitimate partner for the discussion of peace and take out the Jewish communities in the world from the discussion of peace, I think we are deconstructing something for the benefit to, of the people who live here, settlers and natives alike. If we divorce Christianity and Christian Zionism for any vested interest in this country, and, and even Islam from vested interest in this country, and we allow people who live here between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean and the refugees to discuss jointly what kind of a political framework serves them all in the best way possible by rectifying past evil, redistributing resources and so on, this is not an easy conversation. This is a very difficult conversation. But as I said before, we could have had this conversation 50 years ago. For 50 years, we had conversations about two-state solution, people to people. God knows it had so many synonymous, uh, synonymous, th this uh, uh, futile process of supposedly peace. Imagine if we would have invested all the time and energy in those 50 years to talk about the refugees, the settlers, the natives, and how they can live together. Not talking about territory, not talking about nation states, but talking about human rights and civil rights. Something that also the people of Syria need to talk about, the people of Iraq need to talk about. The West has imported the idea of territorial sovereignty to this area, not just to Palestine, to the whole Eastern Mediterranean, and we are reaping the bitter harvest of this Western idea of sovereignty that was meant anyway to serve imperial interests and not the interests of the people themselves. But it was a mesmerizing idea, so people got there. I'm going now to a different lecture. Uh, I, I should stop there about this one. Just about the fragmentation, I, I owe it to the, to the uh, uh, person who asked the, uh, this. Um, I think that we should not be uh, um, dispirited by the fact that very few of us have the political power to change the op reality on the ground. Fragmentation by a settler colonial movement is a powerful criminal act that is done with a lot of force. Uh, people keep asking, how can you compare the Assad regime to Israel? How can you do this? I mean, look what they're doing. And I say, Israel in 2016 doesn't need to do what the Assad regime do, does. It already did it in 1948. One to one it did it in 1948. It used TNT barrels from the airplane to bomb Palestinians. It expelled Palestinians. It executed Palestinians. It, did the, it perpetrated the same crime that Assad has perpetrated against his own people and everybody else is now perpetrating in Syria. We have to remember that. Israel doesn't need to use the means that Arab regimes are using against their own people because they already did it very effectively uh, against the Palestinian people in 1948. We don't have the power to defragment the fragmentation through politics now, but we can do it through the Facebook, through the internet. We can talk to Enhelwe, we can talk to Amman, we can talk to people in Detroit, and we can talk to people in Santiago. We can talk about the one-state solution, even if we are not ministers and even if we are not politicians. The beginning of a conversation of a defragmentation has the power eventually to defragment the reality. This is our kind of roh al -jil, zeitgeist, uh, 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 that we are living in. Believing that political elites and economic elites
do not have the absolute power to determine how we should live. Palestine is a prime example of what should be done uh, in order to make politics something that comes from below and not from above. Okay, thank you very much.